approfittatene. Allora, dico due parole introduttive. Eh, la nostra ospite arriverà tra due minuti. Eh, così ci mettiamo avanti col lavoro, per così dire, perché purtroppo deve partire molto velocemente alle tre e mezza. Quindi questa lezione finirà alle tre e mezza per permettere di prendere un treno per Roma dove ha un impegno, poi è una persona molto impegnata, eh, domani deve essere a Bruxelles, eccetera, eccetera, l'abbiamo incastrata in questa iniziativa così, eh, in maniera un po' fortunosa. E, dico, scusate, scusate, un paio di cose introduttive, non mi sono presentato, non è scontato che tutti mi conoscano, mi chiamo Roberto Belloni, insegno relazioni internazionali e altre cose qui al Dipartimento, questo è il primo incontro del corso di relazioni e organizzazioni internazionali. Con gli studenti di relazioni e organizzazioni internazionali ci rivediamo domani e parliamo in maniera più diffusa di cosa si farà durante questo semestre. Quindi iniziamo eh, accidentalmente con un ospite. Ehm, e invece con gli studenti c'è, sicuramente ci sono almeno alcuni studenti di State and Nation Building, ci vediamo alle 4. Che cos'è questo incontro di oggi e con chi fa parte di un progetto, ehm, diciamo c'è un fondo di finanziamento della Commissione europea che eh, si chiama Jean Monnet, che finanzia tutta una serie di iniziative educative per gli studenti ed altro e qui a Trento c'è un centro d'eccellenza Jean Monnet che è dall'altro lato del parcheggio e, e insomma insieme all'osservatorio Balcani e Caucaso saluto la direttrice Luisa Chiodi abbiamo presentato un progetto qualche mese fa, un anno fa circa e che è stato finanziato il progetto è sulla politica estera dell'Unione Europea eh, l'allargamento dei Balcani e la resilienza e all'interno di questo progetto abbiamo avuto un piccolo finanziamento per eh, poter fare varie cose e una di queste è avere dei graditissimi ospiti. Eh, ehm, oggi appunto il nostro ospite, la nostra ospite è Natalie Tocci, che ringrazio davvero per essere qui. Eh, si dice a volte a sproposito non ha bisogno di presentazioni, <ride> e questo forse proprio non è a sproposito, nel senso è una persona molto nota, notissima. Eh, prima a pranzo le ricordavo che alcuni anni fa ero a pranzo a Sukumi, voi vi chiederete dov'è, eh, la capitale dell'Abkhazia, paese secessionista eh, dalla Georgia e la prima cosa che mi ha detto il mio interlocutore mi ha detto conosci Natali Tocci, <ride> quindi la sua fama diciamo, si estende oltre, ben oltre i nostri confini. Diciamo. Eh, attualmente direttrice dell'Istituto um, Affari Internazionali, professore onorario all'Università di Tübingen, eh, il ruolo forse per, lo, per il quale è più conosciuto anche all'estero, credo si possa dire, è quello di special advisor dell'altro rappresentante Mogherini, eh, poi ha fatto tante altre cose, non ve le racconto tutte, eh, parlerà di politica estera dell'Unione Europea, Global Europe è il titolo della, della sua presentazione, lo farà in inglese, quindi... Interessante, <ride> e, e, ha pubblicato tantissime cose, eh, vi invito a controllare, guardare ehm, il suo sito sul, appunto, eh, presso l'Istituto Affari Internazionali, ma vi ricordo semplicemente eh, la pubblicazione Framing the EU's Global Strategy, uscita nel 2017, che appunto parla del processo di eh, costruzione della strategia europea. Eh, Natalia è stata diciamo, una pedina fondamentale nel, nell'elaborazione di, di questa strategia globale. Ehm, L'ultimissima cosa che devo dire dal punto di vista amministrativo, un secondo solo, è la, la Commissione europea eh, ha le sue regole, come ce l'hanno tutti gli enti amministrativi, e ci chiede di raccogliere le firme. Eh, di chi partecipa, quindi vi chiedo la cortesia di firmare, sono quattro foglie, sono tutti gli stessi, stampati, col cognome, nome e la firma. Quindi se per cortesia faccio circolare, il primo foglio lo lascio in prima fila, poi a metà, poi in fondo, e poi non partite oggi alle tre e mezza mettendovi in tasca i fogli, ma per cortesia <ride> appoggiatevi sulla cattedra. 
Credo di aver detto tutto, grazie tante. Natalie, questo è il microfono, un secondo solo forse per la... Ah, ecco, l'ultima cosa che devo dire è questo. Questo evento è video registrato. E la lezione sarà disponibile in un sito dedicato. E per riprendervi avremmo dovuto ehm, chiedere consenso per la privacy a tutti, eccetera. Quindi la registrazione sarà fatta solo da questo lato. E lasceremo spazio 10-15 minuti per le domande e ci sarà un, un balletto, cioè io che gira col microfono per <ride> farvi chiedere la domanda al microfono, perché altrimenti non vi si sente. Credo di aver detto tutto, vi ringrazio, ringrazio soprattutto Natalie Tocci per aver accettato il nostro invito, benvenuta e un minuto solo. parte alle tre e mezza sono le... sì, Ken Kessler. allora mi si dice che i potentissimi mezzi tecnologici dell'università di Trento ci consentono di mh, collegarci in video collegamento dall'aula Kessler che è al... sapete tutti qual è giusto? quindi le persone siete tutti invitati a rimanere qua se volete ma se volete sedere in maniera un pochino più comoda tra pochissimi minuti tra un minuto parte il video collegamento, quindi potete assistere alla lezione dall'aula Kessler. Lo dico naturalmente a quanti tra voi sono in piedi. Grazie. Grazie Roberto. E adesso tra un secondo passo, passo all'inglese. Volevo solamente dire che sono veramente felice di essere qui, di essere tornata all'Università di Trento per un brevissimo periodo sono stata nel Consiglio di Amministrazione del, dell'Università e devo dire che è un'università che è molto vicina al mio cuore, quindi insomma sono molto felice di essere qua. Uh, altra cosa, e poi passo veramente all'inglese e passo ai contenuti, eh, che sono veramente felice che l'Istituto Affari Internazionali uh, ha siglato uh, un memorandum of understanding con l'Università uh, di Trento, una convenzione, e quindi mi auguro che in realtà ci sarà modo di fare tutta una serie di attività insomma, nei prossimi mesi e nei prossimi anni assieme. E I'll switch to English now. Um, And uh, indeed, the, the way really I wanted to start was, was really by sort of making a reflection that has to do with, with all of you. Uh, a question that I have been asking myself uh, sort of quite a lot in, uh, in recent months, in recent years, particularly as the European Union has really been undergoing its deepest existential crisis, uh, uh, which is an existential crisis which perhaps shouldn't be defined as a crisis because it's been lasting for the best part of a decade um, and normally crises uh, don't last that long uh, but it's certainly an existential moment uh, that has been lasting as I said uh, certainly since uh, the onset of the global financial crisis which is basically 10 years ago from, from now and, and, it, and we're still not through. So a question that I have been asking myself quite, uh, quite a lot in, in recent times is really what is the point uh, of the European Union today uh, in the 21st century? And, and indeed if one goes back to the origins uh, of the Union, uh, it's clear that the rationale for the European Union was a strong one, it was a very idealistic one. Uh, it was an ideal uh, shared by only a few. Uh, but it was a powerful idea that essentially led to what has been one of the most, if not the most, ambitious projects uh, of international relations, uh, probably of all times. And it was an ideal that had to do with peace, it has to do with peace on the continent uh, after the death and uh, destruction uh, brought about by two devastating world wars. Uh, it was an ideal that lived on after the end of the Cold War, where again it was an ideal of peace and reconciliation uh, that led uh, to what eventually became the enlargement, the Big Bang enlargement uh, of the European Union uh, only a couple of decades ago. Uh, but as I said, it was an ideal that was shared by a few. Let's say it was the ideal of the generation of my parents, probably of your grandparents. Then I asked myself, so what has been the point for my generation? So people that today are in their 40s and their 50s, what has been the European Union for them? 
And I think for me, in all honesty, the European Union has been an incredible opportunity. In many respects, it's been an incredible luxury. Uh, I, uh, you know, from, from the luxury of uh, interrailing when I was uh, 15 years old, uh, through to the huge opportunity and luxury uh, of studying in a United Kingdom pre-university fees uh, and, of course, pre-Brexit. Uh, it was the opportunity of traveling freely, meeting my next you know, future husband, clubbing in Ibiza, uh, and eventually getting married in Spain. Uh, it was the opportunity and the luxury of landing uh, from whatever plane in whatever European city and being able to switch on my phone without rushing to switch off roaming charges. So all this has been an, an incredible opportunity, an incredible luxury. But again, if I have to be honest with myself, I have to admit that it's been an opportunity for me, it's been a luxury for me, it's been admittedly a luxury for many, so not the few of my parents' generation, but many, but it has not been an opportunity and a luxury for all. Uh, and very clearly, and this is obviously a story that goes well beyond uh, the European Union, if one talks about the so-called uh, uh, sort of left behind of globalization, and then again, the European Union is a form of globalization. Again, it's one of the most extreme forms of globalization. One has to admit that the luxuries and the opportunities for many have not been there for all. So then I ask my question, what is the point of the European Union for you guys? I mean, what is the point of the European Union for generations that today are in, the in their 20s? Uh, what is the opportunity for my son? Uh, what was the point of the European integration for my son who's seven years old? And I think, and here I come to the main topic of what I wanted to talk to you uh, about today, I think the point about European integration, not for a few, not for many, but for all. And I think it's uh, not necessarily an ideal, uh, not necessarily a luxury, but it is a necessity. It is basically a global rationale. It is basically the only way in which, as European citizens, we can hope to protect our interests, our values in the 21st century global world. And let me spend a few minutes to explain to you what I mean by all this. Now, let's begin with what has probably been the hardest area of, uh, of European integration, and that is the area of security and defense. Uh, as you know, originally, this was how the European Union was supposed to begin. If one goes back to 1954, the idea of a European defense community, again, the ideal that would have uh, allowed the integration of the defenses, uh, beginning obviously with France and Germany, was then a project which failed. Uh, it failed and then eventually the European Union came about uh, through a process of economic integration with the establishment of the European economic communities. Now, interestingly, uh, I think the story that can be told uh, certainly of the last four or five years is basically one in which the area of security and defense from being the most um, resistant to systematic cooperation, indeed, to integration between member states. Why? Because defense is the area in which sovereignty is most jealously guarded by nation states. Has it actually become, over the course of the last commission, or the institutional mandate which is now coming to an end, essentially the most promising area of integration. And it has been happening, and this is perhaps the more interesting part of the story, precisely at a time in which sovereignisms and nationalisms have actually been on the rise. And so I think it's interesting to ask ourselves the question as to why that is the case. And here I come back to the point that I'm trying to make about the logic, the rationale for the European integration in the 21st century being an intrinsically global one. Uh, and what I mean by this is that in the 21st century, scale and weight matter. Mm? Uh, arguably, they've always mattered, but they will matter, and they do matter even more today than they did uh, in the past. I mean, if we look at an area like defense, and if you compare the European Union combined uh, to, for instance, the United States, 
Well, uh, then if you take what we spend on defense, uh, if you add, if you like, 28 uh, defense budgets together, we basically don't spend very little on defense at all. We basically spend more or less 60% of what the United States spends. Uh, that's not, you know, we're, we're talking about hundreds of billions of, of euros. Now, if you compare what we produce, uh, what, we be, what we're able to do with that 60%, of what the United States spend, then that percentage goes down to about 15%. And why is that the case? Because obviously by having 28 little bonsai armies, we end up fragmenting, duplicating what we all have. So we all have a bit of the same military capabilities, which means that collectively we're actually able to do very little. Uh, at times we're able to do absolutely nothing. Uh, on our own, and hence we keep on relying uh, on external actors, first and foremost obviously the United States, or so has been the case up until recently, um, and let's say so far we've managed to go along this way. It has, and here I want to underline this, it has entailed a big cost, uh, because as I said, if one just looks at it in purely financial terms, essentially what we end up wasting uh, with this proliferation of national defense budgets is, and here estimates range quite hugely depending on exactly what you calculate as waste and duplication, but they oscillate between 30 billion and 100 billion a year. So we're not talking small money. But let's say it was an economic waste that one could afford uh, to have because, as I said, politically speaking, defense was this jealously guarded national prerogative and you did not want to deliver it to the supranational European level. So far, more or less so good. Now, what happens, though, when beyond that economic waste, which has been there for decades, you add on the huge political and strategic question mark as to whether someone else, meaning the United States, is actually going to come to the rescue. What happens in a world, and indeed it is already the world that we're living in, in which the United States will no longer be the global hegemon? Uh, up until the end of the Cold War, it was of the West, uh, of the quote-unquote free world. After the end of the Cold War, it was on a more global scale. Uh, but it was essentially the uh, first and foremost uh, super, uh, supranational power. Uh, now, what happens if that's no longer the case? Uh, what happens if the United States either no longer has the ability or perhaps does not have the will to actually come to the rescue of Europeans? And I think this is basically already the moment that we're living in today. I often define the Trump administration as being the second post-imperial American administration. Now, you may ask, why? Who, what was the first one? Well, I would say it was Obama and the Obama presidency. Now, of course, these two presidencies, these two uh, administrations have been very, very different in nature. I don't think I need to spend much time to uh, underline this point. But both were post-imperial, meaning that uh, they were both expressions of the United States that could no longer sustain a system that is essentially larger than itself, the so-called international liberal order. Now, in the case of the Obama administration, there was uh, a very strong attachment to that international liberal order, but the uh, increasingly entrenched conviction that the United States could not sustain that order on its own, and therefore the whole point, and if one kind of reads in between, and not perhaps only in between the lines of Obama's foreign policy, everything was basically aimed at redistributing responsibilities uh, uh, to different allies, partners uh, uh, across the world. If one thinks about the Asia pivot story, uh, about the leading from behind in Libya, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, i.e. the Iranian nuclear deal, uh, the climate peace, uh, the climate uh, Paris negotiations. I mean, if one thinks about every single one of these uh, big landmarks of Obama's foreign policy, it, everything has been aimed at basically redistributing responsibilities so as to sustain an order that the United States could no longer sustain on its own. Now, Trump, obviously, we're talking about something very different. 
Uh, but I would argue that it's equally post-imperial in the sense that not only is there an old story of the fact of the United States no longer being able to sustain an order larger than itself, but in the case of Trump, there is no will to sustain it. Now, there is, though, the awareness, I mean, the appreciation that the United States is still the strongest kid on the block, uh, and so it's able to extract as much benefit from that system, even if the price to be paid is to break the system altogether. But Trump doesn't care. He's able and he's willing uh, to, to break that system. Now, coming back to the reasoning that I was making about European security and defense, why is this important? Well, it's important because Trump, let's take the case of NATO, and it has an extremely transactional approach. And so he basically says, hey, guys, are you spending your 2% uh, GDP on defense? If the answer is no, well, then I'm afraid I'll have to question Article 5 uh, of the North Atlantic uh, Treaty. Uh, and the, uh, Article 5, for those of you uh, who may not uh, know, is the article that basically says uh, that within the alliance, and if we think about NATO, we're basically talking about 23 out of 28 member states of the European Union, an attack against one is an attack against all. Uh, and therefore, there was basically this comfort uh, amongst Europeans that says, says you know, if, if worse comes to worse, if Russia decides to move against Europeans, if we're under attack in any shape or form, the United States is going to come to the rescue. Well, with the United States that has this growing question mark over its ability and its will to come to the rescue, then we're left with the uncomfortable question of saying, you know, it is not simply an economic rationale that should be leading us to think about integrating our security and defenses. It becomes an existential political rationale to do so because there may actually be no alternative, because we're unable, as Italy, as Germany, as France, and not to mention as Luxembourg or, you know, whatever, smaller states, to actually protect our very basic security interests on the national level. And so we will simply no longer have that rationale to duplicate unnecessarily moving forward. And this is why, as I said, we now have within the European Union this sort of growing and bubbling debate about European strategic autonomy. Now, strategic autonomy does not mean that the European Union wants to do things on its own. It will always, and again, because the European Union is internally this most extreme form of multilateralism, it will be always inclined to look externally for partners. But what if externally partners do not want to act with the European Union? Well, in those cases, Europeans have to be able to be autonomous uh, and therefore to act on their own when partners will not want uh, to act with it. Now, a second uh, set of, uh, of examples that move from security and defense to, to the economy, which is, again, a fundamentally global rationale for the European Union. Now, all Europeans, beginning with uh, myself or, or pretty much everyone in this room, obviously care uh, very much about their well-being, given by the quality of their work or their education, the quality of their leisure, the quality of the air that they breathe, the water that they drink, etc., uh, now, because we essentially, again, live in an intrinsically global and interconnected world, it is clear that all of these things, will only, we will only be able to continue to enjoy them if we connect, if you like, to the rest of, of the world. So we try and negotiate free trade agreements, for example. Uh, and we're, we try and negotiate not only free trade agreements, we also want to negotiate fair trade agreements, for instance, agreements that have embedded within them standards, you know, labor standards, uh, or standards concerning environmental protection, or a number of different standards. Now, in what way would we be able to negotiate interests huh, that, as, as I said, touch fundamentally the condition of citizens uh, of the Union if Italy were to negotiate or try and negotiate a free trade agreement with China? It is clear that, again, weight and size matter. And it is only if you are basically a union uh, that represents, you know, plus or minus 500 million citizens that you can hope 
to negotiate your trade agreements with your Chinas and Indias, or in the past, obviously, very recently, uh, states like uh, Japan or Canada, if you do so as a union that represents that weight rather than if you do it uh, from a national perspective. Again, another economic stroke digital uh, example. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the actually relative big success stories of the last commission actually has to do with competition policy. Uh, if you think about the way in which the commission has tried to negotiate with some of the big tech giants over the course of the last commission, these are all things that, again, just imagine even large member states like Italy uh, or Germany trying to negotiate with Microsoft or Google. Uh, uh, anything from uh, privacy uh, through to uh, tax policy, if you like, it is very clear that the weight that we would have on a national level would be close to nil. And we are only able to stand up and sit at that negotiating uh, table with major tech giants that have, in many respects, far larger weight than even some of the largest uh, states in the world, if we do so as, as a union. And again, I could provide other examples that have to do with climate policy or energy, but I'm not going to go into all of these uh, details. Um, let me just highlight one third sort of set of, uh, uh, of, of you know, one, one third area uh, where I think essentially there is this very strong global uh, rationale for the European Union in the 21st century, and it really has to do with uh, rights and freedoms. Again, these are things that uh, are essential components of our well-being, uh, the fact that we are able to speak freely, to think freely, more or less, uh, or are still able to do so, um, to gather freely. I mean, you know, everything that basically falls into the box of uh, human rights and democratic uh, freedoms. Well, again, these are all things that, of course, in many respects, we uh, do take and have taken for granted, but it is increasingly clear that as we move in a world uh, in which the powerful countries uh, are going to be essentially, I wouldn't necessarily, and by definition, define them as illiberal countries, but at the very least they are non-liberal countries, are going to have an increasingly strong voice. Now, one of the debates that perhaps many of you will be familiar with uh, in international relations is the debate about soft power. Now, soft power is something that we've been used at uh, thinking and studying, uh, meaning the soft power of you know, the United States uh, in the world or in uh, Europe in its uh, neighboring uh, regions. You know, the fact that we are em able to emanate uh, our norms, our you know, goodness, whatever in the world, and we're able to do so through basically non-coercive means. Huh? We're able to do so because of a power of attraction. Now, underpinning that power of attraction uh, is, of course, uh, something which is not soft at all, and it's basically the fact that you are and you are perceived as being powerful. And therefore, other countries uh, in the world, other peoples in the world, basically wanted to become, quote-unquote, more like us. Uh, and therefore, yes, obviously there was money involved, there were means that were, to a degree, coercive, but it didn't actually cost that much money, and it didn't cost that much money precisely because there was this magnetism, this power of attraction. Now, what happens when the world starts turning in a completely different way, uh, when actually it is those countries that are illiberal or non-liberal that are perceived as actually being on the rise? And this is obviously the story of China, if one looks at it from an economic perspective. Uh, one can make the argument from a more strategic perspective thinking about Russia. Uh, one can think about the Turkeys of this world. I mean, you know, there, there are obviously many, unfortunately, examples out there. But what if those kind of political systems, those kind of leaderships, are actually considered by segments of our own populations as delivering more, uh, as being more effective? Then you have, and unfortunately this is the risk that we're undergoing, I mean this is basically the historical juncture that we're at, you basically have that hollowing out from, from within uh, and therefore an erosion of those rights and freedoms within our own liberal democracies. 
A question that I'm often asked is, uh, you know, particularly uh, sort of given uh, the current political moment in Italy, the current uh, parties in government in Italy, uh, the approach, for instance, that they have towards Russia. A question that I'm often asked is, so, you know, what's the story here? You know, how much money does Putin actually uh, spend in order to win over uh, Lega or the Five Star Movement? And in all honesty, I have not done research into this, but my guess would actually be not much at all, if, if any. And why would I say not much at all, if, if any? The reason why I would say it is because, very unfortunately, there is no reason for Putin to spend a lot of money uh, in winning over segments of public opinion in Italy. Why? Because there is that power of attraction. There, because there is that power of attraction of the man in his torso, uh, you know, horse riding and delivering in a way in which our messy liberal democracies are unable to do so. Again, be it economically, uh, be it uh, socially, be it strategically, etc. Now, with this, I'm not obviously arguing that the man in the naked torso has an impact on, on me or, or even on you, uh, but the point is that it does have an increasing draw upon segments of our own populations, which is why I think you do have uh, the sort of, or I'm not saying it's the only reason, but at least it's part of the reason uh, why there is this growth of nationalisms and sovereignisms and authoritarianisms within European liberal or once upon a time liberal uh, societies. And why do I again reconnect all this to the discussion about Europe? Because again, I think, and I'm deeply convinced, that if we want to continue having that seat at the global table, in which around that table there will also increasingly be illiberal powers, and if we want not to, because I think it's an illusion to simply think we can maintain the quote-unquote international liberal order as it was. I think it will necessarily have to change uh, as the power configuration in the world changes. Uh, but if we want to continue having that voice, we can only really hope to do so as a union and not uh, as individual uh, nation states, which simply do not have that weight and that size to sit around that table. Now, the last thing, set of things that I wanted to say, uh, also given the, the, the course that uh, you're all uh, participating in, is how does all this uh, reconnect to uh, questions uh, such as enlargement uh, and a notion that has been very central uh, to the European Union Global Strategy, which is the uh, document that, as uh, Roberto Belloni was, was mentioning, uh, I... Uh, was holding the pen for uh, on behalf of HRVP Federica Mogherini. Um, now, let me begin with, um, with the enlargement story and then reconnect it to the resilience story. And of course, these two notions are very connected to, to one another. Uh, on enlargement, uh, we're basically, and, and I sort of want to draw the link back to everything that I've been saying up until now, meaning the global rationale for the European Union. We're in the situation in which, on the one hand, the imperative of ongoing enlargement, precisely because of everything I was saying up until now, uh, size and weight matters, we're all too small to go it alone, etc., becomes even more pertinent today than it was in the past. It becomes even more of a necessity today than it was in the past. Because ultimately, these are states, and here I'm particularly thinking about uh, the Western Balkans. I mean, in many respects, uh, Turkey has a different uh, history, including imperial uh, history. Uh, and I think history shows that it has been able, in a sense, to stand on its own uh, two feet, um, in ways in which uh, the countries of the Western Balkans uh, have not simply, again, because size, has, uh, size matters. Uh, but in the case of the Western Balkans, as I said, it's very clear that um, given the way in which uh, big power blocks, if you like, are, are evolving, they're basically either going to fall on one side or on the other side of the fence. Huh? It's very difficult, difficult to imagine. And in this respect, we do live in a very different world from the world that we lived in in the 1990s, where we had, on the one hand, if you like, a liberal, or I should say neoliberal or hyperliberal illusion of an end of history. 
On the other hand, uh, we were enamored with sort of post-modernist theories about, you know, entities with fuzzy edges, etc., in which one did not have to choose uh, which camp that they were on. It looks like today we've kind of been plunged back in a very geopolitical age um, in which countries of the Western Balkans basically will either fall on one side of the fence or the other. Uh, so they will either fall basically within the sphere uh, of, uh, and, and therefore the, the confines of the European Union, or they will be increasingly drawn uh, towards Russia. And this, again, has uh, these different powers of attraction, because I don't mean to say that, there isn't, that, that the EU's power of attraction is no longer there, but it competes with these other models. Now, I think in many respects, this basically makes the logic of enlargement far more pertinent today than it was even a decade ago. On the other, the reality within the European Union itself, uh, and particularly the reality within the European Union after the enlargement to Central and Eastern Europe, basically demonstrates um, that there has been a political price to be paid, uh, that there has been a price to be paid in terms of a reduced cohesiveness and an increasing questioning of those liberal, and here I want to emphasize liberal because ultimately the European Union is a liberal project, huh? um, values within the European Union itself by what are now an increasing number uh, of member states of the Union, many, not all of which, uh, happen to be in Central and Eastern uh, Europe. So how do you square this circle? Hmm? How do you square basically the circle on the one hand of a, a growing imperative of enlargement and on the other hand a growing necessity for greater political cohesiveness within the union itself? Uh, here my conviction is, and it has been for a number of years now, that basically the only way to square that circle is through um, a, a great um, sort of uh, institutional slash political uh, definition of what already is a functional or thematic differentiation within the Union. And what do I mean by this? What I mean is that already the European Union is uh, a differentiated, internally differentiated uh, entity. Uh, you already today have uh, members of the Eurozone and members that are not in the Eurozone, members that are in the Schengen area and members that are not in the Schengen area, members that are in the Permanent Structured Cooperation on Defence and members that are not in PESCO, the Permanent Structured Cooperation on Defence, uh, etc. The, the problem is that all of these existing forms of functional differentiation don't have a broader institutional stroke political uh, uh, expression. So you still have only one commission, one European Parliament, one, uh, one council. And somehow one has to be able to create a, let me call it, core of the cause, hmm? a group of member states that out of their own choice, not out of imposition, happen to be in every single one of these deeper forms uh, of uh, integration, and that they will eventually form uh, the hard core, if you like, of, uh, of the Union. Now, when it comes to countries that are not currently in the Union, like countries in the Western Balkans, uh, then it is clear that there cannot be an a priori exclusion uh, of these countries from, if you like, an inner core, but uh, there will have to be a very clear set of the rules in terms of rights and responsibilities. And mind you, this is something that should be applied, obviously, both for current members of the Union and what will eventually be future members of the Union. And what I mean is that if you choose politically to be within a particular core, you have to accept both the rights and the responsibilities. So if you are Italy and you want to be in the euro and you have all of the benefits of being in a single currency, because nowadays we tend to forget those, but obviously there was a reason why Italy wanted desperately to be uh, within the euro when the euro came uh, into being almost two decades ago. Then you have to accept the responsibilities that come with it and therefore the rules that come uh, with it. Uh, and you may not particularly like those rules, but no one has forced you actually to be uh, within the eurozone. The same argument, in my view, should apply to Schengen. So you want you, Poland, uh, you want to be in the Schengen area. You want to have the rights that come with free movement. 
Well, then, what ought to be the case, and of course it is not the case, but what in my view ought to be the case, is that there should be an acceptance uh, of rules that have to do with common asylum, an eventual common asylum policy or common migration policy. Again, you want to be in PESCO, uh, in the Permanent Structured Cooperation on Defense, because a security, and here I come back to my first argument, rationale tells you that actually you're kind of better off and safer if you are within a more structured form uh, of, uh, of cooperation on defense. Well, then you will have to accept a certain number of, uh, of rules and responsibilities that come with that project beginning with the level of defense spending uh, up until, and perhaps even more importantly, uh, ending with the level of necessary cooperation with other member states. So every project will have its rights and responsibilities. And again, you know, coming to the point about the Western uh, Balkans, because again, I think the same argument should be made both internally and externally. It will not be a question, or it should not be a question of exclusion within an inner core, but it will have to be a degree of clarity as, as I said, that rights come with responsibilities. Last point, and then I'll uh, uh, open up for, for questions, uh, has to do with the notion of resilience. Uh, and I think what's interesting about this uh, notion is that what was originally thought of as a notion that basically applied to the EU's surrounding regions, and I use the term surrounding regions, A, because I absolutely hate the term neighborhood, which I find terribly uh, Eurosceptic, uh, but then also because the term neighborhood has an institutional, if you like, significance, uh, uh, whereas what I mean by surrounding regions is anything that goes from enlargement countries uh, and ends up to the east more or less in Central Asia and Afghanistan and to the south, more or less in Central Africa. Huh? So basically a huge geogra geographic area surrounding uh, the, the Union. Now the term resilience was initially, originally thought of uh, as a term that was um, useful uh, in guiding policy towards these regions. Why was it considered to be useful? Because again, if we make the switch away from a very neoliberal uh, and modernist, I would say, understanding of uh, processes of, of change and progress, uh, the various isations, uh, whether we're talking about modernization, democratization, etc., which basically had inbuilt them, uh, within them, the notion that change was maybe complicated, but it was linear. And we then bump into the reality that actually change is not simply complicated, but it's actually complex. And what I mean by complex is that it doesn't play out on a sort of two-dimensional plane, but actually it kind of is multidimensional, uh, and therefore it has that inbuilt complexity within it. If one sort of uh, casts oneself within that reality and realizes that change may ultimately lead to good places, but even in the best of circumstances, it is marred with lots of ups and downs and sort of stops in the way, then one realizes that the condition that you need to have, a bit like a metal uh, that is resilient, is a metal that bends without breaking, and you have inbuilt that notion that there will be a shock coming to the system that could be internal, such as exactly the sort of increasing challenge within our own democratic societies of our, our sort of you know, democratic values, as much as external. So those shocks are there. They will come. You just have to take it for granted. But you need to have that condition of, if you like, inner strength and resilience to be able to adapt and to change in order to indeed eventually move, move forward. Um, and that notion, as I said, was originally conceived when thinking about the EU's surrounding regions uh, because it became increasingly obvious that that change was, was not linear. Um, you know, if one makes the example of the Western Balkans, um, it's quite clear that uh, we, and now already for a number of years, we're no longer in that world, if you like, that starts more or less in, well, not more or less, it starts in 99 uh, and ends uh, a few years ago in which we thought, you know, the process is long and tortuous, but more or less we're moving in the right direction. 
And now, you know, and I think there's been this awakening already for a number of years, you know, certainly for the last, I'd say, five, six years, this sort of growing appreciation that, oh, no, actually things could go in a very different direction. We don't quite know. And therefore, you need to have that inner condition, if you like, of resilience to ensure that when those shocks happen, they actually do, you know, you are able to bounce back. Uh, and, 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 and therefore move forward uh, in that complex but uh, positive direction. Now, that argument that was, I think, you know, four years ago developed for the EU surrounding regions, I think the interesting twist, and here I'll end, is that it's increasingly being applied to the union itself. So it's the union itself that also needs to have that capacity to bounce back and be resilient and therefore overcome the existential moment that I started uh, this talk by. Uh, and it needs to have it again because those shocks, be it internal, be it external, are there. We're living through them. Uh, we know that, uh, that they will be there and they will continue to, to exist. But if I am right in arguing that the EU in the 21st century will increasingly be a necessity, whether we like it or hate it, huh? then we need to have that inner condition uh, of resilience to ensure that eventually, hopefully sooner rather than later, we will exit the existential moment that we're currently living through. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation, which was very interesting and inspiring. Um, we have um, half an hour, more or less, for questions. Uh, I, um, apparently, the microphone doesn't work, so I will not be able to go around. doesn't matter. The point is uh, to um, have the opportunity to ask a few questions for the recording. Uh, um, the voice of the speaker will be will be able to hear her voice, but not yours. But sorry I'll about that. The please do, please do, please repeat the question. You are very welcome to ask any question. I know today is the first day of the semester, uh, first time in this room with me with Dr. Tocci, etc., etc. So I would like to encourage you to set aside any kind of shyness, and um, you can ask a question. Of course, in Italian, so don't feel compelled if uh, speaking in English is sort of um, discouraging you from asking a question. And uh, I, whoever speaks first is going to get a prize from me. Uh, I don't know what yet, but you will win something. <laughs> See, si, perfect. Yeah, in Italian, perfect. perfect. We can collect a couple of questions if you want, if there is another one, or we can go ahead. Yes, please. So on the uh, first question as to whether, you know, if, there, if illiberal uh, powers in the world are going to have a stronger voice, is it more 
uh, tell me if I've interpreted your question correctly, more because they will have a, you know, because of their relative strength or is it because of our relative weakness, if you like? My answer to the question is, um, in many respects, both. And uh, I would argue that, to an extent, this is structural and almost irreversible, if you like, in nature. And what I mean by this is the fact that, um, you know, sort of history moves in big waves. Uh, I think that the wave that, in many respects, started uh, with the Industrial Revolution and is ending now is no, not going to come back. Huh? I mean, I inevitably, we know that power is shifting, um, and, and I connect it also to the next question, it is shifting uh, from, quote, unquote, the west to the east, which does not mean to say uh, necessarily that the future power configuration will be known. Hmm? because indeed it could be a new bipolar structure between the United States and China. It could be a bipolar structure that is either competitive or conflictual in nature. We don't know. It could be a multipolar structure. And again, that multipolarity could either be competitive or cooperative. It could be neither of these things. Uh, and you know, many talk about a nonpolar uh, structure. I don't know, and obviously no one knows what the future will be. But I think what we do know uh, is that there will be uh, greater diversity uh, and therefore greater normative contestation within, within the future system when and if it settles into a system. I mean, I think now we're in, um, you know, what sort of Gramsci considered the sort of interregnum that uh, tends to be a period rife with shadows and monsters, uh, if one is to paraphrase uh, Gramsci. Um, so I think that's basically where we are. We don't know what that future will be, but we do know that it will not be as normatively convergent uh, as the past uh, system was. And I say, and what I, what I mean by that past system is, uh, as I said, what is commonly defined, uh, you know, uh, through that international uh, liberal order. Now, in that situation, my argument is, if we want to have a place at the table, we need to be able to do so standing united right? because we simply will not have a possibility of uh, getting our voice across uh, if we stand fragmented. Now, does this, and here I come to the second question, you know, are we therefore in a West versus rest uh, sort of Huntington type situation? I would argue not uh, because, I, again, I think that the world that we're moving towards is far more, again, to use an expression that I used before, far more complex rather than complicated. Because indeed we have a situation in which, as I said, power is shifting from the west to the east. That's a dynamic that in all in its um, uh, complication is easy to grasp. But of course the story does not end there. We have a situation in which power is diffusing beyond the boundaries of the nation state. This is the old story about globalization, and then one can add the, if you like, 4.0 industrial revolution story about the digital uh, uh, age, in which we can make the argument that power no longer simply resides within certain subjects, so, you know, country X or Y, or, you know, even company X or Y, you know, a story about globalization, has power. The point about power in the 21st century is that it flows between different subjects rather than residing within uh, different subjects. So all this makes it incredibly complex and therefore very difficult to basically say, well, you know, there is a group of actors, be they states uh, or be they non-state entities, uh, with which the Union uh, or the West uh, have to sort of uh, liaise with and partner with in order to defend their interests against the rest. Again, this is, I think, um, it, it will, I think that the world was going to be far more complex than, than that. And therefore, and here I come to a notion that is also very dear to my heart, which is, the, which is in the global strategy, um, that is principled pragmatism. Uh, and many have considered this to be a contradiction uh, in terms. And of course, it is a contradiction in terms if it is interpreted in the wrong way uh, of basically saying that EU has to compromise on its principles in order to be pragmatic. 
or to be realistic, huh, some would say, that was not the way in which, that is not the way in which it should be understood. The way it should be understood, in my view, is that um, one has to have a very pragmatic uh, assessment of the world. Hmm? You kind of need to know where you are, but you also need to know very clearly what your principles are. In order to pursue those interests, uh, and, and therefore values, to me they are one and the same, uh, in not the world as you would like it to be, but in the world as it is. And applying this to the whole discussion, for instance, now about multilateralism, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a very interesting uh, retreat with uh, all uh, EU ambassadors to multilateral organizations. So, you know, from WTO to UN, its various agencies, etc. cetera. Um, and they were, uh, it was very interesting because um, they were basically sharing their experiences as ambassadors, uh, essentially saying, you know, we no longer simply have a group of quote-unquote like-minded uh, countries uh, that we partner with because what is and who is like-minded with uh, on some issues is not like-minded on other issues uh, and so we cannot simply say well you know on whatever issue we have to work with we will partner with the United States and Japan and Australia and South Korea well no uh, because of many issues like whatever climate or, or today trade actually you can't partner with the United States uh, and you have to be far more pragmatic in looking out for different partnerships with different African countries, different Asian countries, different Latin American countries. You have to be guided by your principled objectives, and this is why I come back to the idea of you need to know what you want huh? and be guided, in my view, by what your principles are, which ultimately define those interests. But we have to, you have to pursue pragmatically in complicated, complex, different multilateral settings what those principled objectives are. Uh, because the configuration, the coalitions, if you like, uh, uh, of your partners, of your allies, will change from issue to issue, and at times even on the same policy area from time to time. Um, and, and therefore, you know, simply as I said, categorizing you know, the like-minded and, and the non, and therefore the West and the rest, I think does not capture uh, the, the complexity that we're living through and we will continue to live through. We have more time. Oh, sorry. Please. So the question is about Brexit and how it's going to, the likelihood of Brexit is going to weaken, possibly weaken. I think it's a very good, uh, excellent question. Um, I, I would say that in, so the, 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 the question is, uh, we can almost divide it into two and say, you know, what is the political cost of Brexit for the Union and what's the political cost of Brexit for the United Kingdom? I would say that when it comes to the Union, and, and therefore the 27 uh, member states, that political cost uh, has actually already been absorbed, because that political cost basically came on the 24th of June uh, 2016. Because, you know, for the first time in history, rather than a union enlarging and therefore attracting others, it was losing pieces. Huh? And the whole debate back then was internally, which is the next domino that is going to fall. Uh, and there was, you know, 20, the second half of 2016, and I would say until uh, the election of Emmanuel Macron in May 2017, the whole debate was, you know, given the elections in the Netherlands and Austria and France and then Germany, you know, which is the next state that is going to fall? That was, if you like, so there was the big political cost internally and there was a big, big political cost externally because, again, the rest of the world saw this kind of union that was losing pieces and, uh, indeed, it no longer attracted but it repulsed uh, its own citizens, uh, etc. Um, that was on the one hand, then there was also another big debate of basically saying, you know, the UK, the, the, particularly when it comes to foreign policy, uh, the EU is now going to be losing the state that 
uh, has, you know, be it in terms of like the three Ds uh, of foreign policy, uh, defense, diplomacy, and development, uh, the member state that contributes basically the most, not to the union, uh, but on, on national terms, and therefore it's, it's losing one of its most important pieces. Um, now, as I said, I think all that cost uh, was paid immediately, even you know, before, because as we know, Brexit has not happened yet, but the perception of a Brexit happened meant that that cost was paid immediately. The price was not paid by the United Kingdom, uh, and that is why I think we're seeing what we're seeing now. <laughs> um, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, I think uh, in many respects, you know, I, I spoke about a post-imperial United States. I think that Brexit is the big post-imperial moment of the United Kingdom. It kind of came, you know, a century or so late. Uh, <laughs> but, but all of a sudden, they sort of realized, you know, because initially there was the real conviction that, of course, we can get a good deal. And you kind of thought, well, how is it possible that you can think that you can get a good deal if you're one, you know, no matter how big and important you are, negotiating with 27? And of course, they didn't consider themselves to be that one uh, because they still considered themselves to be something much bigger than, <laughs> than what they are. And now the reality is hitting them that actually they are just one. Uh, and no matter how big and important they are, they are just one. And uh, they, I think, are beginning to pay, and I'm not talking here about the economic uh, cost because that's still to, to come, but the big political cost in actually realizing that their credibility, not only within the union, but also in the external world, has dramatically diminished. Now, my experience is mainly within uh, the union. And, uh, and I must say that I have found it really remarkable how over the last two years, um, the weight of the United Kingdom, that obviously, as you know, still sits around the table, has diminished dramatically. No one, you know, the way in which the dynamics of negotiations in the council work, it's all about understanding, you know, what is the critical mass of support for a certain position, you know, basically sort of making friends and, uh, and alliances on any particular question. And the UK was really pivotal on many of these areas. Now hardly anyone turns to the United Kingdom, even if they sit around the table. So, you know, I think they are only now beginning to pay the big price of Brexit, and precisely because they are beginning to pay that price, I now don't know what is it that is actually going to happen. I think that um, because... Because we are no longer where we were, uh, as in we no longer have the debate about Frexits and uh, other exits, etc. Um, so there isn't this fear of a domino effect. There is rather the fear of a hollowing out from within because of nationalisms, etc. Uh, but I think, and I think we're all very almost surprised at ourselves at how we managed to actually stick together on the Brexit question. Um, I think that there's going to be very little encouragement coming from the Union for a second referendum uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, but it's very, as I said, you know, having said that, it's very difficult to know exactly how things are going to play out because the UK is in a complete state of political meltdown um, where the big political cleavages doesn't, do not run between party lines but within party lines, both within the Conservatives and within the Labour Party. And the mess that's going to come out of this, I mean, God only knows. Any other question? I'd like to try to take the advantage of being the chair and, um, and uh, to ask you, actually, the question it is actually formulated into two parts. And uh, I'd like to go back for a second to the issue of resilience. Because um, perhaps not all of us are um, familiar with the, uh, with the issue. I think it would be useful if you could um, um, explain a little bit more what is really the difference between uh, the idea of a linear progress and uh, how we have conceived of uh, political and economic development uh, up to a few years ago, really, not too long, and how, uh, by contrast, 
our resilience uh, is expressing a different concept of, uh, of society, of politics, of the economy, and so on. So I'd like to encourage you to say a few words more about this. And in addition to that, uh, I'm very curious to ask you, from a policy perspective, from the point of view of the European Union, what does it mean to promote resilience? How do you, what, what is you doing uh, institutionally, and I'm practically in the field, uh, and I'm thinking particularly in the Balkans, but I don't know if you um, are uh, aware of the details, I don't know uh, of what is doing the Balkans, but more generally, how does, how can we operationalize, I think a social scientist would use this word, um, the notion of resilience in practice, and, uh, and perhaps a uh, final point, uh, um, what is the, th the current thinking about the operationalization of resilience within the EU, whether within the office of High Representative Mogherini, for example, there is a team working on this, I I'm not sure, um, how it is being implemented, I guess, is the general point, thank you. Okay, so to the first part of, um, of the question, um, let me perhaps say a few words as to why, why, you know, sort of what was the thinking behind this notion in the first place? Um, and, and I think there were basically sort of two sets of considerations, argumentations. Um, the first had to do with the fact that we, you know, already four or five years ago, um, there was not only in the policy community, but even in the academic community, uh, there was this questioning of the idea of a European Union that was a normative power uh, that simply, you know, through different policies of conditionality and socialization, etc., um, sort of propagated its norms uh, and goodness to, to the rest of the world. Uh, beginning with the enlargement countries, but also the neighborhood countries, etc. So there was already pushback against that uh, with a very different notions of saying, no, you know, we're back in a geopolitical age uh, and, uh, you know, the EU has to become more of a carnivore and here we have, you know, big, bare uh, Russia and, uh, you know, and the, the world is big, bad and ugly and we kind, can't simply pretend that we live in cuckoo land uh, emanating our goodness. Huh? Um, now, resilience in many respects tried to uh, embed a notion of pragmatism that was not realism. And here I'd really make the distinction between these two, both theoretically and, uh, and, and empirically, these two notions. Um, so rather than sort of, you know, not going, uh, avoiding that the pendulum uh, swung all the way to kind of, you know, we have to be real politic and da da da, uh, basically saying, yes, fine, we kind of, you know, understand the fact that uh, the world is not that rosy place that, uh, that we imagined. Um, but at the same time, we still fundamentally believe that uh, unless certain key notions are uh, and it's not just, you know, in the political domain, you know, human rights and democracy, but also, you know, in the socioeconomic domain, et cetera, in the climate domain, I mean, in, in many policy areas, we kind of know that we still need to strive for certain principles uh, and, certain, and certain norms. Uh, but we have to do so in here again. You know, I think resilience fundamentally captures also the notion of principal pragmatism that I was uh, mentioning earlier. So kind of, you know, finding a half, uh, putting it in terms of a halfway between sort of, you know, more, more normative and more real, sort of real politique vision is also the, not the correct way of putting it. But again, you know, trying to blend principles with pragmatism was basically one set of argumentations. The second uh, was really uh, a more, I would say, institutional uh, rationale uh, that was, again, one of the major rationales for having the global strategy in the first place. Uh, and the reason, the main reason why the global strategy is called a global strategy uh, and therefore is not called a security strategy is not for geographic reasons, it has to be geographically global, but it has to be thematically global. 
uh, and therefore it has to be uh, a foreign and security uh, policy strategy, but it also has to be an external uh, economic strategy, climate strategy, energy strategy, etc., etc. Now, the interesting uh, sort of thing about resilience is that this is a concept that not only in the academic literature, but also in the policy world, has actually been used by different policy communities. It's been used by the security policy community. Originally, it was used by the food security uh, people, the humanitarian uh, community. It's been used in, uh, by the climate community. It's been used by the energy community. It has been used by the security and defense community. And given that the whole point of the global strategy, as in, as in, again, global strategy, was trying to bring these different policy communities that tend to operate in their compartmentalized silos, actually get them to talk to one another for starters and work together ideally, being, you know, finding a common language uh, around which they could uh, talk, basically, was, was considered to be value in and of itself. So it was a very institutional uh, rationale, which I think was the second uh, set of reasons. Now, how has this actually worked in practice? Um, let me sort of answer first the, your third part of the question, and then I move on to the second. Um, the, rather than uh, institutionalizing it at cabinet level, uh, meaning the HRVP and her cabinet that would have, you know, a, you know one or two people would have a dedicated to resilience, uh, that would have been, which could have been a way uh, forward, but would have been a very short-term way forward because cabinets are by definition political and so, you know, here comes the next HRVP doesn't like the concept and normally new people don't like old people's concept because they want to want to bring in their own thing and therefore end of story. So the idea was trying to sort of, in, sort of literally institutionalize it more. Uh, and so what was done, and deliberately um, the cabinet, including myself, took progressively step backwards from actually playing uh, a greater role, uh, was making this a more institutional project. First by, you know, I realize this sounds terribly boring, uh, but this is how these machines operate, having a joint communication on resilience, uh, which is what happened uh, in, well, the work started in the fall of 2016, and then the joint communication was published in the summer of 2017, which basically was a, you know, the way, work, way in which these joint communications work is that you set up a working group, basically, um, that includes both representatives of the European External Action Service as well as representatives of the different directorates general of the European Commission. Uh, and in this particular case, there were uh, representatives from, you know, from DG Connect, uh, to DEFCO, uh, to CLIMA, to again, you know, trying to bring in these different policy uh, sort of strands. And together they worked on a joint communication. Now, I remember sort of, because I, I used to participate in these uh, meetings, at times I kind of thought to myself, that's not really what I meant, you know. I mean, <laughs> but then I really thought to myself, what you meant, Natalie, is really neither here nor there. Because the point is, it has to become their thing, you know, there has to be ownership. And so inevitably the meaning and, and therefore the implementation will change. But unless they consider it, consider it to be their thing, it will never be implemented in practice. Uh, and so, you know, I kind of, I, I play, obviously I did play a role, but I deliberately tried to sort of, and this, I could make the same argument on defense, I mean, on many of the aspects of the implementation of the global strategy of trying to sort of deliberately, increasingly take a step back so as to ensure that after you've disappeared altogether, uh, then the idea lives on and is implemented in practice. So how is it being implemented? Is it being implemented in practice? How is it being implemented in practice? Um, here I would say a couple of things. I mean, I think one signal on the positive side, uh, one signal that actually something is uh, happening in practice and this is not necessarily, I mean, you know, nothing has one single cause. Huh? So obviously I'm not saying that because there's resilience now this is happening, but it is part of that story. Um, I think that increasingly you do have these different DGs working together. Um, so increasingly there is, 
the notion that, um, you know, if you want to try and whatever, promote democracy, uh, you cannot neglect the climate impact uh, of your policies, or you cannot so there is this greater interconnection uh, between both at Brussels level, and so at DG level uh, within the Commission, but also sort of trickling down at delegation level. So I think this is, it happens more between some policy areas than others, so I would say that certainly there has been a big step change forward uh, in the connection between the more security people and the more development people. I think there is still a very, very, very long way to go in the connection between the more internal security people and external security people. So if you like, the more foreign policy people and the more migration people. Uh, I think there, there is still lots of disconnect. But I think this is a, uh, a moving story uh, of greater, uh, greater connection. As to where I think there is, you know, there's the beginning of change, but there's still far too uh, little change, and every time there is a crisis, one tends to fall back into the old mistakes, uh, is, you know, again, I think the, 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 the question is, the, is the, the poignant one, you know, if you're trying to promote resilience as opposed to promoting democracy, what is it that you do that is actually different? Huh? Well, I would say that if you uh, f sort of want to promote democracy, uh, one thing that you will very instinctively um, focus on is, for example, elections. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to promote resilience, it's not that you don't focus on elections, but perhaps you have a greater eye of concern for institutional, institution building. Uh, you know, sort of those things that allow you faced with a crisis, faced with a shock, to be able to hold without collapsing altogether. Now, I say that, you know, I think intellectually this is something that is increasingly understood, and so I do think that there is an impact, if you like, of a notion of resilience. But at the same time, I do think that faced with a crisis, one tends to fall into the same mistakes. And I think if we take the probably most recent examples, example, which is Venezuela, one can highlight this. Huh? So, you know, very clearly, we, you know, we don't like Maduro. Of course, we don't like Maduro. Who can like Maduro? I mean, apart from people in our government, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, but all of a sudden, the minute in which you don't like a leader, you latch on to the next leader and you just say the only thing you need to do is go for new elections. Hmm? And again, it's not that you don't need to have elections. Of course, you need to have elections, but that cannot be the only thing that you focus on. Um, because, you know, look at what happened uh, in the Middle East after the Arab uprising. So, you know, one keeps on falling back into the same mistakes <laughs> with the minutes in which the crisis hits. So I think there, there is still a very long way to go. We have maybe time for one last question, if there is any. Natalie? If I may, one last thing that I really wanted to sort of take this wonderful opportunity of having so many of you in uh, the room uh, was to highlight uh, the fact that as the Istituto Affari Internazionali, uh, we have launched, and this is already the second edition, uh, of a prize. Uh, it's called uh, the YAI Prize, the Premio YAI. Uh, the first year that uh, we launched the prize, we had a wonderful and incredible number of submissions. So basically, it's an essay prize. Uh, it's for, and I think many of you uh, will qualify for students aged under 26. Um, the, in the first edition of the prize, we concentrated on Europe and the future of Europe this year because of the European elections uh, coming up. We're focusing on democracy and the future of democracy, and also the nexus between the digital age and democracy, uh, again, within a European uh, context. Um, the prize, you'll see all the information for the prize on the uh, um, EI website, so that's www.iai.it. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of what the prize is, uh, actually are, uh, but I uh, really invite you to look into this. Um, 
it's a great opportunity, I mean, beyond the prize itself, uh, but also because uh, the way in which we've tried to construct this prize is to give young people uh, the opportunity not only to make their voices and, and ideas heard, uh, but also have the opportunity to discuss uh, their ideas with people that are not only confined to the institutional and political world, although we did in the uh, prize uh, ceremony event have people like uh, Federica Mogherini and others given, giving their message, uh, but also having you know, actors and sports champions and uh, you know, sort of having the opportunity to discuss their ideas that are not supposed to be academic ideas, but really kind of what you think as citizens, basically, and you know, still fairly young citizens, um, about you know, key questions where our generation and older generations obviously have made quite a lot of mistakes, otherwise we wouldn't be in the situation that, uh, that we're in, um, and therefore really do want to uh, hear from, uh, from, from young people what their thoughts are. So it's, you know, I consider this to be basically the flagship initiative of the uh, Istituto Affari Internazionali. So I just wanted to take these few minutes to really kind of welcome and invite you all to take a look at this and uh, hope that many of you can participate. Thank you. Grazie, Natalie Torci, grazie a voi per essere venuti. Eh, noi dobbiamo scappare, ma do appuntamento agli studenti di relazioni e organizzazioni internazionali domani alle 14, senza quarto d'ora accademico. Quindi inizio alle 14 e finisco alle 18, no, e finisco alle 15.30, quindi il tempo è sempre lo stesso, e agli studenti di State and Nation Building tra un'oretta alle... 16.15, non so in quale aula, ma insomma a presto. Ah, se mi portate per piacere i fogli delle presenze. Grazie. Grazie. A chi non ha firmato per cortesia? Manca un foglio, per piacere.